Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the newest episode of Pro Musicus Family of Artists. I am so delighted from Milano, Italy to welcome Emmanuel Segre, classical guitarist and winner of the 1987 Pro Music International Award. Uh, welcome to the show, Emmanuel. We're so delighted to have you. Thank you, Richard. I'm delighted as well, and thank you for having me. It's, uh, you know, I love the classical guitar, and there's something so special about attending a classical guitar concert. Uh, the intimacy of it and the, the, the closeness of, 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 the, of the instrument that the audience feels. Um, you know, when you won the 1987 Pro Musicus Award, did you win it in Europe or did you audition in Europe or did you audition in America? Um, I auditioned in uh, uh, New York at the end of, of uh, 1987, yes. In that, so in New York, in the United States. Now, can you tell us about you know, how you got started in classical guitar and just a little bit about your background and, uh, and how you got drawn to pro musicus and you know, just, just a little bit about your development as, as an artist and, and where you went to school and whatever strikes you. Sure. In... Um... In 1986, I graduated at the Milan Conservatory, and uh, where I and studied. That's where, and, and, and that's where you're from originally. You were born and raised there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was born in Switzerland, in the Italian part of Switzerland, in okay. uh, Arno. But since I was four years old, I, uh, Milan has been my hometown. So I, I studied at the Milan Conservatory. I studied um, guitar and uh, violin and composition as well. And um, Milan was and still is a very lively cultural center in which to grow, you know. And um, 1987, was uh, um, a very special year for me because uh, uh, I won two competitions, uh, uh, both in uh, uh, New York. Uh, the first one was the East and West Artist Prize for the New York debut uh, at Carnegie Hall, and then the Pro Musicis International uh, competitions. And um, I remember I was looking at the biography of a cellist. Uh, um, his name is uh, Robert Cohen. I believe he's a British cellist. And um, uh, reading at his bio, I noticed there, uh, there was written that he won the New York competition. So I went to the United States uh, uh, Information Center in uh, Milan and ask them to help me to find out more about this New York competition. And, um, and so this lady brought a copy of the musical America. And, uh, and I remember she said, this is your Bible, you know. And, uh, and, um, and so I looked at the musical America, found out all the in in information about the competitions and uh, and I was very intrigued by the fact that, that these competitions were open to all instruments to all in, uh, instrumentalists you know and um, so I came to New York in the springtime of 1987 for the audition for the East and West Prize then I came back in October for oh. my American debut at the Wild Hall at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a beautiful occasion, and I also got a very fine review from the New York Times. And then towards the end yes, of the, the year... The, the New York Times said, he played with great rhythmic buoyancy and flexibility, delicate touch, and a finely honed technique. He held the audience's attention closely. Now that's pretty darn good for the New York Times. <laughs> and um, and so then towards the end of the year, I I I came for a third time uh, to audition for the Promusic International Competition. I I sent uh, um, a cassette. I remember a cassette tape, uh, and then I w of a of a live performance, and then I was invited for the audition and I remember 
arriving at the America's Society in Park Avenue, uh, where the um, competition took place. And I was greeted by Dorothy Yaroshi, the executive director at that stage. And, uh, and, and the atmosphere was, was very calm and, and beautiful. And I remember entering to, for my audition and I saw the jury. And as a matter of fact, the jury started to laugh because they were expecting a girl. Because you see... Emmanuel Segre, because uh, in in my name in the Italian version it's spelled with a final e at the end, and we are talking about pre-internet time, so there were no videos, no pictures, and um, and and so uh, I played for this fantastic jury with Gunter Schuler, with uh, Morisa Bravanel, the conductor. Of of uh, Luis Krasner, who was uh, the, um, the violinist who premiered both the Alban Berg and the Arnold Schoenberg Violin Concerto. My and goodness. then David Leisner, the guitarist composer. Sure. Sure. So my wonderful jury. Wonderful jury. And so my long lasting relationship with the uh, Promusicis uh, uh, started there. So you. Um... It won the competition before John Hague had joined as executive director in 1987, correct? You, John uh, Hague was not with the organization. Right after uh, I won, he, he joined the organization. Exactly. And then at this point, could you talk to us a little bit about your relationship with Father Merlet? Sure. I mean, um, I met him in New York and also in, in Paris once. And um, Father Mele was a visionary. He loved music, uh, and uh, and he had uh, faith in young musicians, and he wanted to help young musicians. And um, but uh, my main relationship with uh, Promusicis was was in fact with John Hague. And, uh, you know, the executive director, he has been the executive director now for more than 30 years, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he's not only the nicest man on planet Earth, but he has, also, he has also been the column of the Promusicis Foundation. Well, he has, given, he has given his heart and his soul to this organization for us and to give us these wonderful opportunities, not only as we've always talked about uh, in the major concert halls where we've played as winners, uh, but also in um, uh, community service concerts, which was so important to Father Merlet to play in places where music wasn't always available. And uh, those were very rewarding experiences as well. Don't you agree? Absolutely. You know, they were always uh, very special for for every concert that we gave, we were we we were also uh, playing two community concerts each right. time, I mean, right. and uh, it was always special and, and very different. Uh, you know, because it's very different if you go to perform in a prison or if you go to perform for uh, terminally ill patients in an, in an hospital. And um, the most memorable uh, community concert that I had, it was uh, in a place called Phoenix, Phoenix House. Phoenix uh, House, down, sure. Downtown Manhattan. And uh, it's a drug rehabilitation center and um, you know those youngsters were in a were coming from a very from a terrible uh, background and and experiences and they were in and, and, and they were in a moment where they were looking for positiveness in their life you know and uh, 
and so and they communicate that uh, to 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 me they they were even very loud but very you know the cheer was so strong and they wanted to hear and they were extremely appreciative of the, of the music that we brought uh, and uh, and uh, so it was a really touching and memorable experience yeah, indeed so rewarding now to back up a little bit can you talk about a little bit about your childhood how you got introduced to the guitar what led you to the guitar and what were some of the major influences as a child um, that made you become a guitarist Yes, uh, both my parents are a known uh, musician, even though my father studied the violin for uh, for many years when he was young. Uh, but, you know, there was the war as well. So, uh, and I am the first musician in, in my family. I also have a younger sister who, that is a violinist. And... Um, I started when I was uh, 11 years old uh, into a middle school that offered music as well. And when my mom got to the got to um, apply for for that school, she remembered that her father went to South America to Chile before World War One and brought back to Italy a guitar that always stayed at home and. Uh, and so she she signed me for guitar lessons, and uh, so thinking that uh, so she didn't even have to buy an in instrument, you know, and uh, and so. But uh, I was very lucky to find uh, an extremely good teacher uh, in this middle school, Maria Evangelista, and uh, and I fell in love with with music uh, from the very first lesson you know and uh, and and this love touching wood is not uh, yet uh, finished and uh, then i went to the milan conservatory where i studied with uh, ruggiero chiesa a very important uh, teacher in italy and uh, and uh, and where i also did my high school and, uh, and as I mentioned before, I also studied then for, for some years violin and composition, which, were, which was very important for my music uh, education. And, uh, and then I graduated in 1986. So a year before you came to New York to, to do the East West and Pro Musicus Prize and, and your Wild Hall debut. Yeah. Now, is there, through the years, is there a, uh, a part of the repertoire uh, uh, that you are attracted to more than another part, uh, a certain type of repertoire that you enjoy playing a period uh, style? Can you talk about, talk about that a little bit, what you enjoy playing, or all different types of periods? or Just tell us what you, what you think about that. Yes, I, I, I like to play music from different times, from different uh, eras, since I was a student. So, you know, I play music from the classic period, from the romantic period, uh, contemporary works, uh, works uh, written especially for me by living composer, music from the lute transposed to the guitar, as well as transcriptions uh, uh, from other instruments, from the piano, from the violin. Do, do you make your own transcriptions? Uh, I like to do that. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I just finished uh, because now with the pandemic, uh, we had so much time, uh, sure. uh, so much more time than usual. And so I did a transcription of a Tchaikovsky piece that I always wanted to do. And it was always there. And I said, when I have the time, I will transcribe that. So this time, I have time. <laughs> Now here's a question for 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 people who don't know that much about classical guitar and all this kind of thing. Why is it that you have such long fingernails? Can you t tell us why that is? Yes, you know it's it's part of the technique to have uh, long uh, fingernails uh, on the uh, right hand. You know you you pluck the strings with a bit of flesh and a bit of fingernail. 
and um, uh, it used to be, you know, the loot uh, used to um, they, the loot players used to play without uh, fingernails, but uh, during the 19th century, guitarists started to change the technique in order to have a brighter sound, in order to have more speed, in order to 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 have more sounds, and uh, and so they introduced this technique with uh, with the fingernails. Now, now, do you find um, when you give your uh, solo concerts on, on guitar? Uh, what is the ideal house size of of an audience for a formal guitar recital? What what do you find the ideal space for that? I think you know it really also depends very much on the quality of the acoustics. You see, you know because uh, if if the if the acoustic is it's great, uh, you can have a fairly large hall. And when I say that, I'm talking about. 700 800 seats um, for example for pro musicis i played in jordan hall in boston which yes, i don't know exactly so nice. i don't know how how many but it's it's a fairly big hall it's probably more than 1000 seats and but the acoustic is so, so gorgeous yeah. and Indeed. so beautiful that the, the sounds carries beautifully you know and um but uh, as an average seat, uh, I would say around uh, five, six hundred people. But the acoustic really can make so much difference. The guitar has got a very small sound, very intimate sounds, but it's an instrument full of colors, you know, and uh, color and soul, and, soul <laughs> and, and, and as you say, intimate. It's a it's a very special experience to attend a solo uh, guitar recital, something very, very, very calming and beautiful and um, just very um, returning back to just, I don't want to use the word simplicity because that's the wrong word, but pure, pure, that's, that's yes, the word, pure. In some ways, you know, it's, it's one of the very few instruments where you really have the sound in, in your hands because, you know, you touch the sounds uh, directly with your hand because a lot of instruments have got uh, either the bow or the reed or even the piano has got all the mechanics you know and uh, they can produce beautiful things as we all know but uh, um, but uh, if there is some peculiar aspect of the classical guitar is that you can mold your sound with your hands directly with your hands mm. Very beautiful. Now, before the pandemic, were, were you touring around Europe giving recitals, or, or is that what you were doing, spending a lot of your time uh, playing concerts? Yeah, you know, it's uh, Italy was, uh, as a matter of fact, as you probably remember, it was the very first Western country to be hit by the pandemic. Yes, and, uh, yes. And, um, and the very first case was in a town which is uh, 20 or 30 kilometers from where oh I live, uh, Codonio. So we were uh, shocked. And, uh, and, uh, and so all my concerts were, were canceled okay. right away. And, uh, and I had friends uh, calling me or sending me emails from abroad, also from the States, and asking me how I was, how we were. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah. Ha have you found uh, during this year and a half that we've been homebound, has music been a great savior to you and solace to you, brought you great kind of comfort and calm, spending, spending time in music every day? Have you found that to be true? Yes, definitely, definitely. And uh, even though it, it has been and still is uh, so deeply sad to receive all this news daily of all these losses and um, but uh, uh, in some ways you know us musicians are quite we're quite lucky you know in terms of uh, having something 
the being stuck at home, you know, I all of a sudden I found uh, a lot of time, a lot more time to do things, you know. And as I said, I made a huge transcriptions, Wonderful. and I Wonderful. and 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 I cannot enjoy not to be rushing from one performance I mean, to yeah, another. It's, 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 it, me too. I'm the same way. Absolutely, it's a real. And, that's so and, and true. That, so true, to, Manuel. To have the calm to 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 practice and to study. Oh, I, I so I so agree. Um, now tell tell me, you have a family? Yes. Yes, uh, I have um, a family and uh, two kids that are now twenty and twenty-two. Oh my goodness! Yes, grown 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 children, grown people. Can you uh, share with us a performance that we can watch? that has inspired you that you look to a performer or specific piece that you that has uh, really uh, meant something to you special through the years yes um you know uh, listening to music uh, it's uh, it's a very important thing for 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 me you know i i love to play i play every day uh, but uh, equally every day i listen to music you know it's like watering a plant you know if i don't listen to music i get dry you know and um, i would like to share and i'll explain you why a mm -hmm. video by leonard bernstein conducting uh um Berlioz work uh, Romeo and Juliet by Hector Ber Berlioz. I had the privilege of hearing Leonard Bernstein live several times, especially at La Scala Theater here in Milan. And I also I also heard him once in Paris conducting um, a full program of his own compositions. And, you know, I was always very taken by this musician that was uh, uh, multitasking, you know, a composer, a conductor, a teacher, and his performances uh, were always uh, so exciting. You know, he had this incredible mixture of, uh, of uh, youthful energy with the, the wisdom of an old man. But it was the very last time that I heard him in La Scala Theater in 1989, uh, that was a miracle. He came to La Scala with a youth orchestra, a very uh, fantastic orchestra, and he conducted only in the second half. But when he arrived, I just couldn't believe the difference. You know, I was seated in the, on the same seat in the same hall with the same orchestra and it sounded so different and mu where, when music become something else something more and magical uh, Mag magical. magical indeed and uh, i was shocked for several days after this uh, uh, concert and uh, i i can really say that it was one of the most Fantastic. important experience of my life there is a documentary a film not of the performance uh, that i heard at la scala but of that tour in 19 in the summer of 1989 
you know, when he watched Bernstein, he had, he had so much charisma, so much energy about him. I mean, can you imagine what it was like when he did his, he, you know, he made his career in 1943 at Carnegie Hall when he filled in at the last minute for an ailing Bruno Walter, I believe, at the New York Philharmonic. Yeah, and he, exactly. be, he, became, he became a superstar overnight and then composing West Side Story and then Mahler conducting. And, and I mean, like you say, he wore, he wore so many hats and how inspiring, what a wonderful thing to hear that you got to experience this, this incredible magic really at the end of his life, 1989. That's the year he passed yeah. away, I believe. So really even more special to, to that performance that you heard. And thank you for sharing that, that very incredible uh, concert experience with us. Can you share with us a performance of yours uh, so we can enjoy and, uh, and, your, and just enjoy and experience your wonderful artistry? Sure, thank you. It's, uh, uh, I would like to share with you a performance of the first prelude by the Brazilian composer Hater Villalobos. Uh, Villalobos that wrote, sure. uh, he wrote uh, some beautiful music for the classical guitar and uh, he had a real understanding of for the classical guitar and he, he used it in a very kaleidoscopic uh, way and um, there was once a man that told me that he thought that the classical guitar was a mixture of a harp and a cello. Wow. And I thought that that was quite an interesting definition of it because uh, we pluck our strings with our right hand like a harp and and with our left hand we are on the fingerboard like fingerboard yes like uh, like uh, on the yes. cello. cello and yes. and this first prelude by villa lobos uh, starts with a section that is actually repeated at the end that has a very beautiful um melody on the basses uh, that are like a cello melody in fact villa lobos played the cello as well and then there is a middle section which has uh, some very fast arpeggios that uh, reminds the arpeggios that an, that an art can do Thank you. 
Now, before we wind up the, this wonderful interview, can you tell us some of the guitarists that you look up to, that inspire you, that you've studied, that you love to listen to? Yes, it's, uh, you know, my, my two heroes uh, has always been Julian Bream, that unfortunately passed away recently, and John Williams. They were uh, very different one from the other, but, um, but two fantastic uh, musicians and two fantastic players that are still... Uh, I learned so much by listening to their recording and to um, and to listening them live, and then I also took uh, uh, master classes with 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 them. This is the wonderful thing about pro music is in our family of artists is that we are first of all we're an international family, and not only we're an international family, but we're a family that plays many, many different instruments. You know, it's not just piano, it's not just violin. It's all kinds of instruments. And as I say, you know, I think that John Haig is, is so proud of all of us and has really given his life to all of, our, of, these, of, our, of us to expand our lives and to make our lives richer and to give our gifts back to, to the world as Father Merlet envisioned when he created this organization in the 1960s. And I always say, and I, I, I always sign off with these interviews, I always say, Emmanuel, that uh, I like to think that Father Merlet is in heaven looking down upon all of us and smiling. And I really believe that with all my heart. And you are included in our family and we are so fortunate to have you. And thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us and sharing your artistry with us. And uh, we look forward to more and we look forward to listening to you, uh, and we wish you every success in the world, and uh, look forward to when you come back to the United States to play concerts uh, on your beautiful, beautiful instrument. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, Emmanuel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful encounter, and uh, Promusic is it's, it's firmly in my heart. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you.